This area is a great example of the benefits of commercial thinning in a second growth forest. The area on the right was thinned by Bob Woods in 1980. The area on the left has been left alone. The trees in the area that was thinned are bigger and the stand generally healthier. The understory growth in general is healthier and bigger partly because the canopy was opened up by thinning, allowing more light and moisture into the forest floor. As well, there are fewer snags in the stand that was thinned. The area that was left alone is very dense and full of snags. You want some snags for woodpecker and insect habitat, but not too many. We left around uh, 250 stems to the hectare here. It was probably as high as 450, 500 stems when we started here. So the um, good value in the stems are left here now in the last 20 years. So it looks, looks like it's working. This area was planted in 1938. Bob Woods thinned it in 1980. Now, 20 years later, the trees in the thin forest are putting on their new volume onto fewer but faster growing trees. Not far from the Sayward Forest is Forbidden Plateau and Al Hawkwood's woodlot. 348 acres in size, this is one of the first operations to carry the Forest Stewardship Council's eco-certification stamp of approval. The Forest Stewardship Council, or FSC, has developed a set of principles and systems for forest management that are endorsed by Greenpeace the only eco-certification system to be endorsed by the global organization. Well, after a few years of, of efforts and whatnot, um, we got the woodlot license here uh, certified by the Forest Stewardship Council and the Silva Forest Foundation. Uh, this just happened in March of uh, this year. And uh, that was, uh, the idea there is that uh, I wanted to measure uh, our performance and our way of managing a forest with with uh, objective and worldwide standards, and standards, and that's what the FSC has in place. Uh, I also wanted to uh, learn some stuff and uh, develop a better um, uh, system of harvesting and managing the forest. Um, and you certainly get that in spades with the certification process because the people that come out here, they're experts, specialists. Uh, they pick apart everything that you do. They make you justify everything you do. So you learn a lot and you learn how to do it better. Uh, Bob Woods, he's been a big influence on me. Bob's, uh, I've known Bob for 25 years now. Bob spent a lot of time with me. He's uh, really been uh, very um, gentle and very patient with me, and he's come up to this forest a lot. He's uh, introduced me to a lot of concepts, like putting in uh, the small uh, f uh, forwarder and tractor trails throughout the area so that you can go back any time and, and pick a tree up here or a tree up there without uh, causing major disturbance. He's uh, contract logged in here. He did the first logging for me as a contractor in here. And uh, it's, his, um, it's his system and his uh, equipment types that, that we used here. His son actually did the falling for me. What we had here in the early part of the century was a, a really nice old growth stand of Douglas fir with a bunch of large cedar in amongst and uh, that forest was harvested by railway logging operations in about the late teens, early 20s of this century. Uh, there was a lot of slash left behind and uh, there was a slash fire, a wildfire that escaped and burnt the area down around 1925 and this stand came up afterwards. It's a natural, uh, natural stand that has never been uh, managed in any way. And basically what we have here is we have um, an overstory of Douglas fir that came in uh, first after the fire and then an understory of western red cedar which uh, likes to spend its early years as uh, an understory crop and gets uh, kind of nursed along with the Douglas fir and eventually as the fir dies out or is uh, attacked by disease or insects or wind throw the cedar then takes over and, and you end up over a period of time with that same type of stand again large fir and large cedars uh, mixed. This uh, particular uh, site here 
This is the kind of cedar understory that I want to protect. This tree right now would make a pulp log or a very small saw log, wouldn't be worth very much at all. Whereas if I can let it grow to be a pole or um, uh, a full-sized uh, standard saw log, it's worth a heck of a lot of money. And uh, I can't compete with the major companies in producing um, pulp logs or um, small saw logs. I've got to do something special to, to make my mark. And so what I'm trying to do is grow um, big Douglas fir, real big ones, and really good cedar. How long is it going to take this cedar? <clears throat> Approximately maybe another 50 years. Here we've taken out a, a, a large Douglas fir tree, uh, we made some money on that tree, released this cedar, and now it'll start to uh, flourish. Um, and what we're doing basically is um, accelerating the uh, stand in terms of its old growth attributes. We're, we're increasing the, um, the, the speed with which the stand becomes what it was when they logged in the early part of the century. Well, one of the other features of this, I guess, is that um, you, you, you're always going to have a forest cover here. You're going to have uh, a stand here forever. That's the idea. We're going to uh, designate at least 10% of the trees that are here now, and uh, they'll be designated as full cycle trees. They'll be left to uh, grow up, die, fall down, and, and become uh, coarse woody debris again. They'll produce the snags that you find in uh, normal old growth forests that you need for uh, wildlife habitat. And, Without snags, um, you don't have woodpeckers. Without woodpeckers, you don't have secondary nesters. And, and without snags, you don't have uh, ants and whatnot for the bears to eat. It's, it's just the full cycle of things, and you don't get that in a clear cut. We're in a, an adjoining uh, clear cut. This is a basic industrial forestry on private forest lands on Vancouver Island. Um, this is um, the way things have been done for a long time. They cut everything down and they replant it. That's private land, they're certainly within the, the law. The well, one of the other big differences between the sort of standard industrial approach to uh, forestry and what we're trying to do here on the woodlot and what's going on in a lot of small-scale forestry now is uh, we create jobs. Um, when you do this kind of clear-cutting, they use uh, heavily mechanized uh, approaches like single-grip harvester, grapple skitter. Um, there's very, very little labor created um, in our woodlot um, I did a calculation uh, relative to the average in BC and we, we create, we, we produce three to up to five times the jobs in uh, harvesting as they do in conventional harvesting. This is kind of a culmination of Al Hopwood's progression as a forester, you know. I mean, I started out as the standard industrial forester with herbicides and and planting and clear cutting and all that stuff and and over the years I've worked in in different places and I've made a progression and and this is what I would like to see happen here um, I think I can make my enough money to be satisfied I, I may not absolutely maximize profits in the short term but I think over the long term I think I can get just as much profit out of this stand as anybody can and yet I can keep a, a continuous uh, uh, set of trees here and I can work towards an old growth characteristic